Rebel al-Assad, first cousin to Bashar, his lifelong opponent, has spent his adult life in exile, fighting for just these three things, human rights, leadership for a Syria free of tyranny, and for a return to peace. He will tell us if there's a path that leads there. While those who remain ask only one question, have you left yet? Imagine a life that includes three attempts of assassination, but still garnered hope during the Arab Spring that perhaps regime change might come after all. But now, Aleppo has just seen its second major siege, and the streets are filled with the pungent scent of cauliflower, because that's all there is that's left that's abundant to cook. And on Facebook, the younger ones have posted something very interesting. An orange for sale, as good as new, hardly used, available to the highest bidder. What will be next? To tell us, we've invited Rebel al-Assad to come and speak to us from London. Please join me in welcoming him, Rebel. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank Mimi first and uh, Mr. Bill Griffith for uh, inviting me to speak here today. And it's a great pleasure to be among so many distinguished guests. I have prepared a little speech, even though Mimi has suggested that I should speak without it, but I think I should go. It's very important that I go into uh, details. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that the situation in Syria and the broader politics of the Middle East are intimately connected and that both have grave implications for the national security of the United States and indeed of the world. Because although the regional character of the Syrian crisis have been obvious for some time, it also has increasingly clear global repercussions. I will go on to explain how regional war dynamics inflamed what began as a merely national confrontation between the Syrian regime and its opponents transforming it into a bloody sectarian proxy war. The greatest danger now facing us is the possibility of this escalating into a proxy war between global powers, but it is more my sincere hope that this danger can be aver averted and that instead of the international community can come together to confront our common enemy, namely Islamic extremism. That will be the first step in bringing lasting peace to my country and the wider region so that its people can begin their journey to true freedom and democracy. Now, as you know, in recent week, Russia has taken on a far more active role, intervening directly to support the Syrian regime, and with over a thousand airstrikes so far, and of course, to a lesser extent, the US and its allies have also been involved in launching airstrikes to support mostly Kurdish rebels fighting against the Islamic State, though not nearly enough to be effective especially when you compare the number of strikes in Afghanistan and Iraq. Back in 2003, Iraq war, the US, and its allies conducted 800 airstrikes a day. But in the current conflict, there were barely more than 7,000 this the year from last October to this October. That's less than a 40th of the intensity in Iraq. Until recently, the US and Russia have taken directly opposing positions on the regime but they certainly have a common enemy in Islamic State, and indeed, one thing most of the international community can agree on is that these barbaric Islamists must be stopped. The Russians have long been convinced that the only way to do this is to keep the present Syrian regime in power, fearing that its fall would allow jihadists to seize control of the whole country, while the US and its allies at first were adamant that the president must go, though they are now increasingly willing to consider a transitional period to allow for stability. For my part, I have been a vocal opponent of the Syrian regime since long before the conflict started, which is why I have been exiled for most of my life and why I founded the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria, but I've always maintained that there must be a political, diplomatic, and all-inclusive transition to democracy in my country. The difficulty, as I'm sure many of you already know, 
is that within Syria itself, the forces of democracy have been marginalized for many years, and anti-regime forces have been dominated by Islamists. There are many different Islamist groups operating in Syria, of which Islamic State is only the leading brand, and they share the same poisonous ideology. Indeed, the irony is that they understand all too well that they are on one side and the international community is on the other, regardless of the differences between the US and Russia, for example. Al-Qaeda's leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has called on his fellow ideologues of all factions to unite against their non-Islamist foes in Syria. As Zawahiri sees it, and I quote from a recording he posted on the internet, the Americans, Russians, Iranians, Alawite, and Hezbollah are coordinated their war against us. Are we not capable of stopping the fighting amongst ourselves so we can direct all our efforts against them? We may not think of ourselves as being on the same side as the Russians, let alone the Iranians, but it's quite true that in the context of Syria, we have a common interest in defeating the Islamists, so should we not be coordinating our efforts? Remember, slaughter and destruction is not collateral damage for the Islamists. It is deliberate and ideologically motivated. It will not stop until they are defeated. Moreover, until that time, they will continue to threaten us all. But before I go on to talk about the, how the international community must respond today and tomorrow to the crisis in Syria, and how it affects our own national security, let me look back at yesterday and how this situation came about. As you, as you all know, the present conflict began in 2011 with a series of protests against the regime, which were widely interpreted at the time in the context of the so-called Arab Spring. Indeed, many Syrians were crying out for democracy and freedom, but sadly their voices were soon drowned out by those with a different agenda. That is why, to this day, the overwhelming majority of the so-called opposition forces are in fact Islamists committed not to freedom and democracy, but to sectarian bloodshed and the imposition of brutal Sharia law. And let me add that their ambitions are not limited to Syria. Islamism is a global movement committed to establishing an Islamic caliphate, not only in the Middle East, but from Andalusia, Spain, to Xinjiang in China. So how was a movement for freedom and democracy in my country hijacked by jihadists with no respect for freedom or for democratic sovereignty? The answer is that powerful regional players intervened and are effectively fighting a proxy war on Syrian soil. As I'm sure you know, the, the rivalry in the Middle East is between Iran on one side and the Gulf state and Turkey on the other and are deeply involved in the Syrian conflict, using the sectarian divide between the Sunni and Shia Muslims to further their own interests. One reason for the involvement of the Gulf state is that they were worried about the dominant effect of the Arab Spring. So they made sure that extremist elements dominated the Syrian opposition from 2011 and used jihadist TV station to foment sectarian war rather than democratic change. And the Gulf states and Turkey alike believed that fermenting sectarian conflict in Syria would bring down the regime in a matter of months, thereby isolating Iran and putting a stop to its nuclear program. Clearly, this gambit failed. Now Iran has signed its nuclear deal with the US. It is in a way becoming a partner of the West. And with the lifting of sanction, it's able to release the fund it needs to further its strategy it has been pursuing since the invasion of Iraq which effectively handed Iran control of most of that country. It is also now able to pay for the Russian intervention in Syria, which has also allowed the Iranians themselves to enjoy more ground troops deployments in there. It should also be noted that while international observer has speculated that Iran's intervention in Syria was about securing the nuclear program, if anything, the reverse is true. The nuclear program, like the intervention in Syria, is only a means to an end. Namely, Iran's long-term aspiration to dominate the Middle East from the Gulf states to the Mediterranean. And ironically, the rise of Salafi extremism since the Arab Spring has only helped Iran. Since minorities throughout the region have heard the hateful sectarian rhetoric on satellite TV and other media owned by Gulf states, and they have seen often in explicit footage on YouTube and so on, the wholesale slaughter of minority groups, whether Christians, Alawites, Shia, Kurds, Yazidis, Druze, and Ismailis. 
not to mention the suffering of the peaceful majority of the Sunnis who do not share the Islamist poisonous ideology. So no wonder those minorities now look to Iran as their only hope for protection. It is a role the Iranians are only too happy to take up. While they still deny having a fighting force in Syria, it has been reported that thousands of Iranians, Marines, have joined the Russian forces fighting the Syrian rebels, while other reports suggest that Iran is supporting thousands more Shia militiamen from Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, and of course, Iranian-backed Hezbollah's forces from Lebanon are openly involved in the fighting. I hope by now it is clear that all this is ultimately the unintended consequences of Saudi Arabia and Qatar channeling billions of dollars and later arms to Islamist groups in Syria and of Turkey's efforts to ensure the Syrian opposition was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. So where was the democratic word when the seed of this cat catastrophe were sown back in 2011? In fact, then U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, along with other Western countries, even recognized the Muslim Brotherhood-dominated Syrian National Council, and it took Ms. Clinton 18 months to realize it did not represent the Syrian people, by which time Islamist fighters were tearing Syria apart. As late as September 2013, new Secretary of State John Kerry claimed at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee meeting that there was no Al-Qaeda presence in Syria long after its presence had been established beyond doubt. Even in 2012, U U.S. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper described the opposition as fractured, not a national movement and infiltrated by Al-Qaeda. And General Dempsey said clearly that none of the rebel groups there share our interests. Also in 2013, Secretary of Justice Eric Holder confirmed that the Free Syrian Army is dominated by the Al-Qaeda ideology and General Lloyd Austin III warned the conflict in Syria cannot and will not be resolved militarily and warned that, if left unchecked, the spread of violence and terrorist activity emanating from Syria could result in a long drawn out conflict that extends from Beirut to Damascus to Baghdad to Yemen. But tragically, the lessons have still not been learned. On 24th of October, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with King Salman of Saudi and agreed to increase support to Syria's supposedly moderate opposition, an entity Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov rightly describes as a phantom group whose whereabouts nobody has been able to locate. Indeed, such is the desperation in some quarters to find suitable allies among the Syrian rebels that some argue the West should back Jabhat al-Nusra, the Syrian affiliate of al-Qaeda, some believe that if al-Nusra Front can be persuaded to undergo a rebrand, then suddenly there will be suitable allies to the democratic world. Even General Petraeus has recently suggested using al-Nusra to fight Islamic State, as if there is somehow good Islamists and bad Islamists, good terrorists and bad terrorists. Because let's not forget that it was al-Qaeda, not the Islamic State, who were responsible for 9-11-7-7 in London and the Madrid bombing. Al-Nusra's leader, Abu Muhammad al-Jolani, was recently interviewed on Qatar's Al Jazeera and tried to portray Al-Nusra as a moderate Syrian opposition movement, but in fact, he only revealed how poisonous he and his co-ideologues are. He reassured religious minorities that the group would treat them as brothers if they distanced themselves from the Assad regime, prevented their children from joining the military, and abandoned their deviant religious beliefs. This is the group our ally Qatar wants us to support. So Sir Malcolm Rifkin, the former chair of the UK Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee, was right to point out Qatar's role in promoting terrorism and insist they must choose their friend carefully or live with the consequences. And I ask, where are these consequences? As for Saudi Arabia, despite, despite this supposedly being a friend to the democratic world, the kingdom's own political culture is deeply Islamist. Last month, 55 Saudi clerics published a statement calling on the Muslims to join the jihad against the Syrian regime and Iran, and claiming that the war was being waged by the orthodox crusaders Russia against the Muslim world. The Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia has in the past called for the demolition of all churches in the Arabian Peninsula, and endorsed a Muslim Brotherhood's leader's call for all Sunnis to take up arms and fight the infidels, Alawites, and Shias. 
Moreover, the WikiLeaks cables revealed that individuals and institutions in Saudi Arabia have pumped millions of dollars into Islamic religious trusts and NGOs from Europe to India, and Saudi officials had high-level contact with America's most deadly adversary in Afghanistan, the Haqqani network. Finally, I mentioned that Turkey was involved from the very beginning of the, Syrian, of the crisis in Syria. It sees Syria as the natural place to extend its influence in the Arab world, cutting off Iran and sealing Turkey's own role as the champions of the Sunnis throughout the Middle East, effectively rebuilding the Ottoman Empire. And just as the Gulf states do, it sees Islamism as a tool to be manipulated for its own ends. So the Islamist threat is not just about the Islamic State and other militants that are and what they're doing to my country. As horrific as that is, it is also being used very deliberately by, deliberately by our so-called allies, which is why we must urgently rethink our geopolitical alliances and priorities. All the more so because, as we, as we, as we well, as a regional dimension, the Syrian crisis also has increasingly gave gl global implications. Since Russia is backing the regime along with Iran, and the West is still implicitly backing the states who oppose the regime, and I'm afraid to say the Western strategy has been flawed from the beginning. The Obama administration more or less admitted this when it announced a $500 million program to create a new moderate rebel force in Syria after concluding that its half-hearted efforts backing existing forces over the past four or five years have had practically no impact. And realizing that even supposedly vetted fighters turned out to be Islamists who have ended up handing over our weapons to the likes of al-Nusra. And now, after just a few months, the administration has abandoned this program too, having realized that after so many years of allowing our supposed allies to promote sectarianism and to incite hatred, violence, and killings against minorities and all those who do not share their perverted ideology, it's simply too late to create an all-inclusive national force from scratch. So yet again, weapons ended up in the hands of Islamists. After all this failure, I find it incredible that some Western observers have the audacity to criticize the Russians for bombing our supposedly moderate rebels. Some people even still invoke the name of the so-called Free Syrian Army, whose supreme military council was in fact exclusively Salafi, and which in any case imploded after the Saudis learned about the US and Iran rapprochement and ordered their people to leave and form the Army of Islam, taking U.S. weapons with them and killing many non-Salafi leaders. Now, if the West had moved early on in the conflict to take a lead by fostering a genuine democratic opposition, by calling a conference for all democratic groups who would sign up to the ideals of equality regardless of religion, sect, ethnic group, or gender, it would by definition have excluded all the Islamists from the start, and there might now have been a democratic opposition forces worthy of the name. Instead, our so-called allies were allowed to take the initiative, as I have described, inciting sectarian hatred and calling for jihad, as we have seen the results. Our priority now must be to ensure to the defeat of the Islamists, which is why I believe the US and Russia must work together in Syria. So while Gen Marine General Joseph Dunford and Air Force Secretary Deborah James have both described Russia as the biggest threat to US national security, I respectfully defer and agree instead with Michael Morell, the former deputy director of the CIA, who said that the single biggest threat to US national security is extremists returning from Syria. And of course, the bigger picture is that Russia has increasingly close ties to China, in no small part because both feel threatened by the West and have been pushed together by their sense of isolation from the West. So this issue cannot be understood in isolation from Sino-US relations, particularly in the context of American plans to sail ships in the waters between Vietnam and the Philippines, signaling that it does not recognize China's territorial claims there and fueling Chinese fears that the US is practicing a policy of encirclement. That is why we should be extremely cautious about allowing the Syrian conflict to become a proxy war between the US and its allies on one side and Russia and China on the other, a danger that has already been raised by the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Fortunately, President Obama responded by insisting this would not be allowed to happen. He told the White House press conference that would be a bad strategy on our part. He can say that again. 
In fact, the U.S. has, clear st has a clear strategic interest in working alongside Russia to ensure Islamic State, al-Nusra, and all who share their per perverted ideology are defeated, because they pose a far greater threat to U.S. national security than Russia does, and one we share with the Russians and the Chinese. Indeed, China faces a particular threat from Islamists in Xinjiang, and has warned Turkey that if it continues to support them, China will support Kurdish rebels in Turkey. But I'm sure we'd all prefer China to be involved in a coordinated international effort to defeat terrorism. President Putin himself has explained his involvement in Syria in terms of the estimated five to 7,000 Russian and other Central Asians now fighting with the Islamists. And he rightly said, we certainly cannot allow them to use the experience they are getting in Syria on home soil. U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter has predicted reprisal attack on Russian soil over these actions in Syria. And indeed, we now know the crash of the Russian plane over Egypt was caused by a terrorist bomb. But the point is that we can all expect such attack if we don't intervene. The problem is not going to disappear because we try to ignore it. China's special envoy to the Middle East, Ambassador Wu Siqiu, has spoken of the danger arguing that, after being immersed in extremist ideas, when they return home, they will pose a severe challenge and security risk. The CIA and UN estimate is that there are a total of 15,000 foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq, but Attorney General Eric Holder has said there are around 7,000 fighters from the West alone, which would leave only 8,000 from other Arab and Muslim countries. And logically, there must be far more fighters from the Arab and Muslim countries than Western ones. The population is poorer, the government have less sophisticated surveillance technology and infrastructure, and there are a lot more mosques and clerics who are funded by some of our allies in the Gulf countries to recruit people. So the number of fighters from Muslim countries must be at least 10 times higher than the number from Europe. A Syrian report last year estimated that in total, there are almost 54,000 foreign combatants from 87 different countries. And given the international character of those involved, there is a clear danger of yet another, uh, other attacks beyond the region with terrorists potentially entering Europe in the guise of refugees. Given the huge number of refugees today, it will not be easy to screen people effectively because in fact, it's hard enough to keep track of our own citizens who are going to join the Islamists in Syria and Iraq. People from the West who have fought with Islamic State have been known to post related images on Facebook or videos on YouTube. And in other cases, young people's parents have reported them to the police. But in the case of foreign uh, refugees, none of these sources of information are available. And it's hard to tell if people are even from Syria. That is another reason that the EU now wants to talk to the Syrian regime, because at least they have a better idea of who the refugees are and which ones may pose a threat. As well as rooting out ter existing terrorists, though, we also need to clamp down on Islamism as an ideology, to prevent them from simply recruiting more fighters to replace them, and that means stamping out the most dangerous breeding grounds for this hateful perversion of Islam on the internet, satellite TV station, and every other form of media through which the Islamists can recruit people from their own bedrooms. The UK government has recently announced an exemplary new strategy to tackle the promotion of Islamism. It includes banning radical preachers from posting materials online and prevents anyone with convictions for extremist activity from working with children. Extremism disruption orders will stop individuals engaging in extremist behavior, Permises used to support extremism will be shut down, and internet service providers will be forced to do more to remove extremist material and identify those responsible for it. As Prime Minister Cameron says, it's no good leaving this simply to the police or the intelligence services. We need to control all extremism. This is exactly what I have been saying for many years, but for too long it fell on deaf ears. As British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond admitted just a couple of weeks ago, and he said, in the UK, we've been too reluctant in the past to recognize the link between nonviolent extremism and violent extremism. Western countries have also been too reluctant to confront our so-called allies about their role in, pro in promoting the ex extremism. After all, it is all very well to take measures to protect Western citizens from radicalization. But unless we go after the source of radicalization, there is little point. And what I have told you about this is not news, but it is well known. 
Bernard Squarcini, a previous head of France's counter-espionage and counter-terrorism intelligence agency, has pointed to Saudi intelligence supporting extremist groups from Afghanistan to Lebanon and Syria to Egypt to Mali. And the former head of French interior intelligence, Yves Bonnet, has accused both Qatar and Saudi Arabia of funding extremist Islamist networks in France. Just over a year ago, looking back at the conflict so far, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden told students at Harvard University, our allies in the region are our largest problems in Syria, and explained, as I, have, as I just have, that they have effectively started a proxy Sunni-Shia war in their determination to bring down the Syrian regime, deliberately cultivating groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Nusra, Islamic State, and others. It was later reported that the Vice President subsequently apologized even for raising the issue of our allies' complicity with such groups. But it is ridiculous that the most powerful country in the world should be apologizing for telling the truth. We must name and shame individuals and states who are responsible for spreading extremism. And we must ensure that counter-extremism strategies like that unveiled by the British government are rolled out not only throughout the West, but perhaps even more importantly throughout the Middle East. And that means insisting that our allies, including Turkey and the Gulf states, play their part in fighting Islamism rather than fostering it. And of course, we must do as much as we can to promote economic development and political freedom throughout the Islamic world and beyond, so that young people there can face the future with hope instead of the despair in which extremism thrives. This will not happen overnight, but the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria is committed to making helping that happen, as is the Imam Foundation, which I founded to promote dialogue, challenging extremism, and bringing change across the world. And I believe that organizations like the World Affairs Councils of America also have a vital role to play in this process. The first step in bringing peace to Syria, and consequently greater security to the whole world, is to recognize the severity of the crisis and its inherently international character. Then, when you can focus on the underlying problem of Islamic extremism and resolve to tackle it with renewed vigor while holding to liberal and democratic values, because only they will ultimately secure our national security. Thank you very much.